Hello and a warm welcome to Federal Special Program Capital Beat. It's almost five months now, and the civil war like situation continues in Manipur. Incidents of violence and terror have refused to die down. Once again, on the streets in Manipur, we can see students up against the government. They are protesting. And this coming in after two Methi teenagers were abducted and killed. And after that, their pictures surfaced on the media. Now, everyone is asking that what is happening in Manipur and why has the center and the state government really closed their eyes? Many people who are residing in Manipur and who are in touch with us on the phone have been saying that Manipur right now, the crisis has worsened. It is going through one of its worst times. What we are going to talk about is the fact that is Manipur's situation now beyond repair? Is it out of control as far as the central government is concerned, as well as the state government? Joining me now is one of the most renowned faces of Manipur, humanitarian author and social activist, Bina Lakshmi Nepram. Bina, it's wonderful to have you once again on the program with us on The Federal. And my first question to you really is related to the two Methi teenagers who were abducted and killed. Now, what is happening really after the death of these two teenagers? Uh, where is Manipur heading to actually? Yes. First, let me just speak about these two teenagers. They live not more than 10 minutes from where my ancestral home is in Terra. And it's um, the, both the teenagers extremely bright. The girl, Linto Ngambi, is 17 years old, student, former student of Manipur Public School, and Tamfasana Higher Secondary School, one of the first women, uh, you know, higher secondary schools in Manipur. Uh, extremely bad, you know, good students whose life she wanted to be in the medical field. She wanted. You know, uh, she was going for tuitions for her medical, and then her life and the life of her friend was just cut short when they were abducted on 6th of July. Uh, everyone knew that they were in uh, in a territory which was not made controlled, and people were searching for them, but then at the same time, because it was in an area where which was not unsafe, which was not safe at all. So people were not able to go there. I remember the cries of a mother saying, my daughter must be angry, asking why my mother, why haven't you come looking for me? These were just students who were going for tuition classes, nothing to do with the conflict, abducted, brutally executed. It's a horrible, horrible crime, war crime that has happened, and we strongly condemn it. This, as you saw, hurt the sentiments of the student community. So the first protest came by her fellow you know, students, friends, who are from Tambasna Higher Secondary School. They came out to protest against the killing, but the excessive force that was used against the students shocked us more. We have seen how pellet bombs, pellet guns have been rained on students. We have seen how tear gas shells were fired and even live rounds fired on students. Luckily, no one has died till now, but one is in a very critical condition at this moment. It shocked the consciousness of a very, very war-tired Manipur that if innocent students in their uniforms to be attacked by India's paramilitary as well as Manipur security forces, then what is left of our democracies? What is left of governing structure? That if students are targeted, 17, 16, 18 year olds, or even younger are targeted like this, the question that Manipuris are asking is, are you doing your operations to wipe us all out? So there is huge enragement going on. The mothers are now out in the streets with bamboo torches. I've seen lines of streets lined with bamboo torches. I've seen massive students continuing to protest in not only in Manipur, but in different parts of India, as well as even protests in Geneva being 
held against this. So it has again caused extreme dis pain and disruption of Manipur was and has been and continues to do so. Yeah. Bina, you said that these protests are, uh, you know, uh, being taken out of Manipur. People from Manipur are going and meeting up uh, with people in Geneva. Yeah. Now, uh, because the media within our country has yeah. closed its eyes, yeah. because the central government and the state government of Enverin Singh has closed its eyes, do you think that is the reason why the Manipuris are trying to interna internationalize the crisis which is unfolding in Manipur? To be very honest, there was a semblance that the, that you know the the two warring groups, the Maitis and Kukis, have, there was a little bit of lull at this what is called peripheral villages where a lot of attacks and counterattacks were happening of both the communities. So this incident of again rearrangement started, there. but during this time, no, the 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 the, the Maiti community did not start the internationalizing of this conflict. What has happened? It is we we are seeing. Uh, we saw the Kuki community, Kukizo community, uh, for example, when the European Parliament happened, turned this conflict into a religious conflict in which it was portrayed that the Christians were attacked by the Hindus. Right. This narrative went even to the uh, to a meeting at the U.S. Congress, and then it even went to the Parliament of World Religion, and it even went to Geneva. So the Maitis went to actually counter that narrative because they said this is a half-baked story. Absolutely, churches were burned, but also burned were temples, but also right. burned were indigenous places of worship because many Maitis belong to the indigenous Sanami faith. Hmm. For them, they don't have like religious places where they go and worship, but the southwest corner of their homes are their places of worship. So when hundreds of thousands of Maite homes were burnt, their places of worship got burnt also. So the internationalizing the issue was not uh, a, a question that uh, the Maites were doing, but they, they actually they did it to counter the wrong narrative which was going on at the European Parliament in Geneva, at the Parliament of World Religion, in which they painted that Christians were attacked by Hindus. Right. So. So this was not true. This is not true because, as you know, the conflict is engineered by men who are connected with guns, drugs, and those who are close to political power in which religion have been used and misused. So I think because yeah, of that... If, yeah, if you may allow me to interrupt yeah. you, uh, yeah. you were saying that, you know, a religious connotation was being given yeah. to uh, the violence which was happening. Now, why do you think religion was brought in? Why were people saying that, you know, Christians are being uh, killed by the Hindus? And why was that religious angle given to the whole story? I think the religious uh, angle, again, for anyone who is engineering conflict, they will utilize every divide. They try to use Hill Valley, if you remember, tribal, non-tribal, religion. So for those who are trying to engineer conflict in Manipur, they will use any tool rather than religion, the diversity of the world's religion make the world a global place, right? But then if you weaponize your identity and your religion, it benefits to put more patrol into the fire, which was already there. So again, religion was misused by those elements who are once, again, this conflict is an ingenious conversation. It's for them, it was a tool that they use to generate more division and more hate so that they could call, call the shots, basically. I'm just wanting to ask you, Bina, you made an important point. You were saying yeah. that it all started with uh, hill versus valley, yeah. that it started uh, with Hindus Tribal, versus Hindus. Yeah, absolutely. Tribals and non-tribals. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand that what sure. more divisive pillars can play out on what more pretext can the government try and divide the society of Manipur? See, Nilu, this uns question, you know, there is division between men and women, right? They, they were, the society made it such to such an extent that, you know, men and women, you know, child and adult. I mean, 
how long can you weaponize our divisions? Rather, we are a world which are trying to see there is beauty in diversity and not generate division amongst diversity as we are the world and we as a nation are trying to move towards a stronger nation, a stronger democracy. But so just imagine uh, that why these things are, are, are divided. It's because, again, as I mentioned, those vested elements, whether they are in drug trade, human trafficking or money, or um, politics, they will use those divisions. And we as civil society, as citizens, have to be absolutely clear that these divisions could be played against us and to protect ourselves from that should be the way in which people in Manipur are going and the people of the country should be going uh, rather than pitting one community. How can you, can you imagine uh, this scenario? It's a real scenario. Manipur has 39 30 uh, plus indigenous groups uh, in ethnic communities. Imagine just taking side of one. What does it put you in? It shows that you have a blinkered eye view of the situation. In fact, if you really care about Manipur, you would look at the entire picture and try to write your report or write your article in a way which will put some balm in the soil because it is not about, so that's why these exploiting of identities or narrating the the, the narrative of one narrative does one story doesn't tell the entire picture right so manipur case is tragically has become like this uh, nilo yeah no but Bina, how far will it descend further what more can happen i mean what worse can happen if i may ask you uh, i just the hope everyone is safe but what worse things can happen now because you have a state government which yeah. is completely completely uh, you know, inactive. State yeah. uh, central yeah. government is just not bothered. Prime minister is not bothered. Now, what worse can you more expect than what is happening really? So, Nilu, actually, what we saw on 3rd of May onwards, the worst has actually happened to Manipur. And I can tell you, Manipur survived that, actually. And it's not because of all the structures you mentioned. It's It survived because of the resilience of the of 3.3 million Manipuris. And I'm so proud of the people on all communities who have ensured that the state survived. But having said that, the state is still under threat because those uh, who have engineered this divide, they failed, they will try again. They will try again. And that's why it's a time for policymakers to really wake up. Because as I mentioned in your program too, the balkanization of Manipur will lead to the balkanization of Northeast in India and it will hurt India's national security interest. Absolutely. Remember, no, you yeah, absolutely. I mentioned this phrase in our last program. Yeah, but my yeah, question but, to you is that uh, day before, I think two, three days ago, uh, the ancestral home of the chief minister was attacked by a mob. Now, yeah. uh, this was supposed to be a mob of uh, people who belong to the Methi community. And yes, so far, absolutely. whatever yeah. we read, you know, being as part of uh, the people in Delhi, what yes. we have to know is that uh, Chief Minister Biren Singh enjoyed a massive support from the Methis. And he mm. was treated as some kind of a messiah. Now, if Methis are also attacking the Chief Minister's yes. house, does it mean that the chief minister is becoming more and more isolated. He's losing the support of the dominant community. Does it go to show that? Nilu, that's a very good point. First of all, the Manipur police denied the attack happened. Can you imagine? The Manipur police right. tweeted a statement. Hmm. Well, the frontier uh, uh, thing. So again, look at the narrative being played about. For the Maites, who are, as you mentioned, predominantly 53%. It was a wrong narrative of the media also to say that the majority of Maite supported. The majority of the Maite supported the protection of Manipur's territorial integrity. The majority of Manipuris uh, were actually protecting the boundaries of India's boundary against external aggression. The majority of Maite and the majority of Manipuris were fighting from day one to protect Manipur as a state and India's most easternmost border. I want your audience to know this. 
Maites and Manipuris have stood for that this engineering of hate and division, this violence which was created should stop. But the narrative which was peddled was painting Maites as the devil, that they were the ones who were hurting others. They were the ones we, and so many Maites were very saddened when this narrative was going on barrage on them for four months when the entire state was under an internet lockdown. Now that they have, okay, okay, no, I'm sorry, you so the just to respond again. So the, right. for, that's why the attack on the on the BJP president's house, the attack, the burning of the BJP office in Thaubal district, and the attack on uh, the ancestral property of the uh, house of the chief minister, all point us to the fact for the for the Manipur people. They will stand that anyone who is hurting the state and its people, they will strong strengthen. This is the, the United Manipur which was speaking at this particular moment. This is for us, for the people of Manipur, it's to say those who have engineered, engineered this hate, this violence, it's a strong message. Stop this. Stop this. Yeah. Veena, you were talking about the divisions uh, just now. And... Yeah. Uh, what about the role of the security forces? Say, for example, a SAM rifle was pitted yes. against uh, the, yes. the Manipur police. And yes. they both seem to, you know, treat each other as rivals. Now, yeah. what happens to, I mean, if the state is already into a dark abyss. And right. there are forces which are protecting the state. They are also pitted against each other. Now, what would you say to a situation like this? And what Absolutely. would you say to the role of the security forces, whether Absolutely. it is the state police or whether it is the central paramilitary forces? Even this emergence of a situation like this, Nilu, is so wrong. We are living in a democratic country in which citizens are not supposed to pick up arms to defend itself. The defense, the protection of every citizen of our country, whether Manipur or Delhi or Nagpur, is to be done by those police or central, you know. So the fact that the communalization of security forces, both of state and center, that has happened is highly unfortunate in Manipur. The security forces should never be communalized. They should be protecting nations and its citizens, irrespective of who they are, what gender, what religion, what Rina, you said you made an important point. You are saying yeah. that there is a serious communalization of the security forces. Absolutely. Now, who's going to be held responsible if the security forces who are guarding the state, they have become communal? Who would Absolutely. you hold responsible? No. Who is to yeah. be held accountable? Uh, absolutely. We should ask this question to the Union Home Minister and the Defense Minister. They right. both should be held accountable as to why. Because we are simple citizens, Nilo. We are trying to ensure there is peace in our communities and harmony in our communities. Big things like defense, military, security are in the onus of the Home Ministry and the Defense Ministry. It's up to them and they only can rectify this. Nilo. So the question you should ask them as to why this is not happening. They should be held accountable. They are our leaders. They are our ministers who are in charge of the police and the military. They should be held responsible and they should rectify this. We've spoken enough on the, the current situation and how is it evolving? What should be done? Now I want to come to the political points uh, yes. as far as the Biren Singh government is concerned. Now, yes. in the last conversation which I had with you, you did mention that, you know, probably there should be an imposition of the president rule. You also spoke about a truth reconciliation commission, I remember very clearly. In one I, I, didn't, I didn't say about president's rule because, you know, because everything is controlled by one or two person in Delhi. Right. So, it, you yeah. know, so we have lost faith as to who should be, but absolutely. But I did speak about a Manipur Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yeah. You are absolutely so right. Question. Yeah. So, Veena, my question is that yeah. what is a political situation? I mean, what is a political solution you look at? Absolutely. Uh, will, will, will the things improve if Biren Singh government is, uh, is removed? Will things improve if the president rule is imposed? Uh, what, what is the situation according to you, which is, which is uh, beneficial for Manipur? You, 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 you see, Nilu, this is a 
this is the challenge that India is going through at the moment, where political decision making is left in the hands of one or two. We are a country of, I don't know, we are the world's largest populated nation in the world now. So you let the decision be taken by one or two without consultation, it's going to really hurt our democracy. So yes, absolutely, there are, even if that's why, at this particular juncture, the prime minister's role is very critical. Someone who has been at the helm of affairs, for him to tell and decide if he announces tomorrow or in the next few hours that he comes to Manipur, First, he has not even visited Manipur since 3rd of May, mind you. Yes, and only spoken when two Kukizo women were assaulted, right? He has not even spoken a word about the two kid children who were killed. But he did congratulate a Manipuri Maitai girl who won a, a silver in the Asian Games in, in, in China. But he hasn't spoken a word or offered condolences to the families of these two little uh, two students who were brutally executed. No, but so we can only hope that the prime minister will uh, break his silence on Manipur. But uh, Manipur is a no go no go zone for the prime minister. Uh, that's, who that's says a that? It's it's a part of uh, the country. No, and I'm, he, saying, yeah. I'm saying I'm <laughs> saying politically, yeah. it's like a no go zone for the prime minister. That's what I'm saying. It, it, why, why not? Why should it be a no-go zone, Nilu? So coming back to a resolution, yes, we, the women of Manipur, the women of Northeast of India, we are also like Nilu, like many others of your viewers who are watching this. We are working towards a solution. We are praying for a solution and actively working for a solution. So these are some of our thoughts. If only our policymakers and people of this country listen to us. First, till today, there is no peace talks, no visible, transparent peace talks. If you say two ethnic communities are, are warring, then why aren't you putting, why cannot the Home Minister's office call the representatives of the two warring groups and then have a peace talk, number one? This has not happened till today. Number two, instead what has happened is I heard there are more than 50 talks behind closed doors which has happened, which are only talks which I, we suspect because we were not a part of it, between different leaders who are armed groups or those connected with armed groups. As a result, you are again making the same mistake which government of India has been making for the last five decades of only talking to men with guns. 17 peace talks in India's Northeast, not a single woman from Northeast of India is a part of it. If the government of India wants to continue to make more mistakes, go ahead and talk only to men with guns. You will not be able to have sustainable peace in the region. That's one thing. No peace talks. Talks are happening behind closed doors only with men with guns. That means you're allowing Manipur to be ruled by men with guns. This is the first mistake so saying, in a democracy. You are saying, you are yeah. saying that yeah. whatever talk is happening is happening behind uh, closed, closed doors. Door. No, there is no, no woman. No, is, so you, you also said that there is no woman who is involved in the no, peace talk. No, you also no. said that there is a talk only with the gun men. Uh, yeah, men only with yeah, only with men who are access to guns. Yeah. Yes. With that, I come to the question. Is yeah. that the reason why the central government and the state government have not bothered to find out as to why the armories which were looted or why those ammunitions have not been recovered? Because they have left the people with guns to rule the roost? Absolutely. It's not just the, 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 the ones with, where the armories were raided out of desperation, Nilu. But what about the weapons which have crossed from over Burma, the weapons which have been bought from other parts of India? You know, the yeah. price of a bullet shot like 200 times during this conflict. They were scrambling to buy weapons from left, right and center. Many. So again, as I mentioned, what has happened to Manipur should, God forbid, not happen in any other part of India. And it should never happen. Because what we saw in Manipur in the last four months 
is what should never happen in a democratic country in which civilians started arming themselves because they lost the faith of the state and central forces to protect them. This is actually a failure, a failure of our governance, of our democracy. So I think, again, the lessons that the country can learn from Manipur is so much that if I start listing, it will not be enough for this program. But let's focus on the couple of yeah. critical points. Manipur Truth and Reconciliation Commission should have been founded in which there should have been both the warring groups. We have the Kuki NP, we have for Manipur, we have the Mayra Paibis. They could have come to a negotiation, you know, and you could have you could have created an environment where those if cookies and maites could meet in television studios and made to debate, why shouldn't they be allowed their conditions be made that they could meet and talk? But no, they did not do that. Rather, they only spoke to men with guns or those who are connected with guns and insurgent groups. So that's number one. Number two, this, so there's so the healing was not allowed to happen. So many cookie families have lost loved ones. They're also paining. The beheadings, the burning in ambulances, the assault of their women. Of course, this pain is also in the pain of so many entire Manipur. And then the Manipur people, the Maite people have also lost. There are 33 Maite people whose bodies have not been found till today. And then in amongst the 200 killed, there were many Maites also. And so many mothers have lost sons. So many uh, women have lost their husbands. So this, the bereavement, the healing, the connection, that has not happened in this particular situation. Rather, what the government did was created what is called buffer zones to further divide rather than heal. So it's like Gaume, rather than healing with Malam, what they put is put another Gau. So right. how can buffer zones are unconstitutional according to many women leaders in Manipur. How could you create buffer zones? Maybe created in India and Pakistan, but in India and China. But how can you create buffer zones within your own country? Absolutely. So this is some of the very wrong steps. And we call upon the government of India, its policymakers, to rethink. Do not, do not play with the lives of citizens in our country like they did in Manipur. Yeah. Veena, to, talk, to, to ask yeah. you very honestly, you are saying yeah. that we need to appeal to the policymakers, we need to appeal yeah. to the center, the state government. But here, all these three institutions, whether it's a policymakers, whether it's a state yeah. government or the central government, when yeah. they have completely you know, blindfolded themselves, they, don't, they are just not interested in Manipur, how long will the battle continue for people like you? The government says that they're doing their best. They gave relief support and they also like instituted the Supreme Court, instituted a three women commission for committee for looking into relief and rehabilitation. There was a circular. It's not that the government was not doing anything. Nilu. They are doing what it can. We know that. Right. We have to give them this benefit of doubt. You're saying that the government is providing a lot of relief to the Absolutely. people. Absolutely. But the question is, Nilu, but the question is, for example, they started helicopter services between Mizoram and the Kuki area. So they could travel, they could come in and out and all of that. And then they've given support. But the question we are going to ask is this, is how come, and I keep asking this, how come the Gujarat riots was brought down in three days, the Delhi riots in 11 days. What is it in the hearts and minds of those who are ruling this country that the Manipur conflict, a very tiny, beautiful, multicultural, multi, is made to burn for the last five months? This is the question that any thinking Indians should ask. That means they are engineering something. What is that something which is making Manipur burn is for any thinking Indian to ask from this current ruling and try to find answers. For us, we know that. When we try to speak that, we are right. not heard. Rather, a different narrative is being generated to, right. to, to, to sort of... There is, as I mentioned, there is a huge illegal economy going on in that particular state of yes. guns, drugs, and human trafficking. It's all connected with that. And that's why, Nilu, let me tell you, in the, last, in the last three, four months since the Manipur crisis, a lot of drugs have been captured at Delhi, in Gujarat, and other parts. Think. 
So there's a huge connection to narco trafficking in which not just the people in Manipur and across Burma, but people within the country are involved in. And if Indians do not wake up to this, then you know Manipur, a tiny state with 40% in the poverty line is a third highest HIV rate in the entire country. Can you imagine? We worry that India, the entire country may suffer as a result of the inability to contain the crisis in Manipur because the disturbed condition in Manipur is misused by anti-national elements, literally, to then destroy the country and its youth Absolutely. by infusing guns and drugs. This is for us, for the people of Manipur. We are warning to the people of India, wake up before Manipur situation spreads to the entire country. One quick final question before I wind up the interview, Bina, that uh, people do say that, you know, Biren Singh should be immediately removed. There should be an imposition of the president's rule. Will things get better if both these things happen? Biren Singh is removed. President rule is imposed. Will the situation improve in Manipur? Just very briefly, I want an answer from you. The only way in which the situation in Manipur would improve is when the prime minister, the home minister and the defense minister, it's to three of them, the three they, if they want, they can stop this conflict tomorrow. It's up to them. Well, I, mm. Yeah. Yeah. What you have said, I don't think anything more is left for me to add on to whatever you have said. Solutions are there, but there is simply a lack of political will to tackle the crisis in Manipur is all what I can say. Thank you so much, uh, Bina. It's always a pleasure having you on the program. And uh, before I wind up, I really want to tell you, you take care and be safe wherever Thanks. you are. Thanks yes. once again for joining the interview. And one appeal to the viewers who are watching this interview, subscribe to our channel, send us your feedback, and stay tuned to the Fed Room. Thanks. Subscribe to the Federal's YouTube page for more news and updates.